here's probably one of the best gangster films released in the 1980s. A violent and colourful look at one man's rise and fall in the world of Miami's drug trade. It's a film whose reputation has grown immensely over time. Like mould on a block of cheese that's fallen behind your fridge and you can't reach it without pulling out the fridge first and that's a whole palaver so I guess just get used to the smell. Oh, Scarface. <laughs> Scarface was originally a 1932 movie that was loosely based on a book that was loosely based on the life of Al Capone, a real-life gangster during Prohibition, whose nickname was also Scarface. Now, I don't know if people actually called him that to his face, but I wouldn't presume anyone ever did so a second time. By the early 80s, Scarface was the sort of project that would have been ripe for a remake, and one day Al Pacino told his then-manager Martin Bregman that he'd like to play the title role in any new version. In my mind, Bregman told Pacino that there was no way he could play Scarface since he didn't have a scar on his face. In real life, they brought in Sidney Lumet to direct the story, who suggested a contemporary setting in modern-day Miami. Lumet eventually dropped out of the creative differences to be replaced by director Brian De Palma. Oliver Stone wrote the script about the cocaine trade at a time when he knew an awful lot about the subject, perhaps too much. And in my mind, he may have well written all four drafts of the script in about three hours at the same time as sanding down his deck, painting his garage and swimming 60 laps. The title card tells us Fidel Castro turfed out of Cuba his opponents, forcing them onto rusty old boats, but not before they took with them the worst criminals in Cuban jails. Tony Montana, a low-rent hitman, arrives in Miami and begins cockily making his way up the ranks of the gang led by the drug lord Lopez, before eventually stealing Lopez's girlfriend and ultimately usurping him as the head of the gang. Here's to old friends and to new friends. Tony himself is a creature of anger and venom. He defers to no authority. In his head, everything he does is logical and sensible and intelligent. Like an idiot conspiracy theorist who ends every sentence with, it makes you think, and Tony is ruthless. We don't see an awful lot of him being a gangster, just key moments of his career and relationships. Like when your friends post Facebook memories, but here it's less self-serving. By the end of the film, Tony's become a parody of an addict, snorting his own supply in every scene. Pacino plays Tony big all of the time, but by the end, his showboating reaches grotesque proportions, like a remake of Gone with the Wind, starring only Kardashians. In that thing? You must be kidding. Elvira is one of Michelle Pfeiffer's earliest roles, and she plays the gangster's girlfriend perfectly. She's bored, miserable, hooked on this and that and the other. Elvira is sarcastic and droll, like that aunt who can't work out why she never married, though here you can see how it's a crutch to help her get through the day. That and lots of cocaine. Manny tries to keep a lid on his friend's excesses. You know what I want? Thought of this the other day. A line of blue news, right? With my name written on the back of chick's asses. He's the more charming and reasonable of the pair, but even he isn't good enough for Tony's younger sister. Gina is 19 to 20 years old during the film and she goes from a hard-working teenage beauty school student to a typical young woman caught up in Tony's world of coke and clubs. Tony is, let's be charitable and say, overprotective of his sister. And when he catches Manny with Gina, things take a turn. Tony is the living embodiment of overreacting to any situation, like anyone appearing on a reality show. Tonight on Coke Island, all I have in this world is my balls and my word, and I don't break them for no one. Cocaine is almost a character in Scarface. Imagine how different the movie would have been with a different drug. Marijuana would have turned this into a broad comedy. Heroin would have turned it into grim Oscar bait. Viagra, a porno. And Stamfine branded Easy Wee Wee Flow would have made the film much more popular in Germany. Aside from his personal addiction, Tony sees the drug trade as his best way to getting what he wants. His philosophy is best described by one of the most quotable scenes in the film. This country, you gotta make the money first. Then when you get the money, you get the power. Then when you get the power, then you get the woman. When they do want to show Tony doing well, we have the obligatory 80s montage set to pop music. Of course, we have a hint that not everything's peachy. In fact, things are distinctly unpeach-like. This lack of peaches sets up a fairly sour last hour when things start falling apart. Tony's got problems with the government. He's got problems with Elvira, who at one point just walks away. Are you even gonna be alive by the time the kid goes to school? 
and of course, problems with his business partners, who don't really like to be crossed. Jean has also had enough with her overbearing creep of a brother and tries to kill Tony, just as uninvited house guests come to end the party. Scarface isn't really an action film, but the climactic attack on Tony's compound is one of De Palma's best action scenes. And of course, it has one of the film's standout moments. Do you wanna play rough? Okay. No. Say hello to my little friend. The dialogue scenes do suffer from having Pacino dominate every scene. For a man of his stature, he still manages to tower over everyone else. Nothing exceeds like excess. You should know that. Pfeiffer deadpans her way through most of the scenes, like a depressed barber, and just about manages to hold her own against Hurricane Al. Stephen Bauer also manages to keep up with Pacino, but his character isn't really pushy enough to deal with Tony's ego. So it's more or less the Al Pacino show and the film doesn't really care about anyone else. I mean, this would be a pattern in a great many movies starring Pacino. They might as well be one-man shows, since you very rarely remember anyone else being in his movies. Scarface's soundtrack from disco pioneer Giorgio Moroder has aged well, one of the few electronic scores from the early 80s that doesn't sound weak or weedy. Scarface actually uses a full palette of colour, with saturated vibrant hues everywhere, reflecting a certain Miami vibe. Instead of a dark, muted, desaturated look, Scarface sears the eyeballs like an imbecile looking directly at an eclipse. Why don't you try sticking your head up your ass? See if you a variety of fake Cuban accents can be heard in the film, but made worse when up against actors with more convincing accents. It's like when you see a movie set in the UK, but it's an American actor putting on a terrible British accent after having been grifted by Stan Fine's dialogue coaching service, where we guarantee your attempt at a Cockney accent is mercilessly mocked by people on Twitter. I'm Tony Montana, a political prisoner from Cuba, and I want my fucking human right now. Just like the president, Jimmy Carter says. Pacino's Tony has possibly the second most exaggerated accent I think I've ever heard, being slightly pipped by Leonard Nimoy's attempt at an Australian accent on Mission Impossible. Come over it, mate. Not very likely, huh? But I could bring it around this Arvo, say around uh, five o'clock. How exotic would the film look if, instead of being Cuban, Tony was from Fulham? Say hello to my little friends. Scarface was received well enough at the time of release. It pulled in decent box office numbers. Big number. Though with mixed critical notices due to the violence. Well, no. Shoot that piece of chip. No. But over time, it's developed quite a cult following and become very influential. People don't look at Michael Corleone as a role model, but think of Tony Montana as something to aspire to. The 2002 video game Grand Theft Auto Vice City heavily cribbed from Scarface, and Scarface even got its own official game in 2006. Like polonium poisoning, Scarface just won't go away. I like Scarface a lot, and I appreciate it more each time I see it. Even if Pacino does go a little over the top, it's a slick crime drama and unlike so many gangster films, it's colourful and bright, but probably the greatest gangster film of that decade. Just to confuse the issue, in 1987, Brian De Palma revisited the original Scarface character with an actual movie about Al Capone and the men charged with taking him down, but confusingly enough, it wasn't called Scarface. The Untouchables, reviewed here. Scarface is quite a unique film for this genre, in its setting and the background of its anti-hero characters, its visuals and soundtrack, but it tells a simple story and tells it well. You finished? Can I go now? If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.